Good evening. My name is Bob Morrison. I'm the director of music here at Westminster, and we are so glad that you've joined us for our annual Christmas concert. You know, there's something special about the music of Christmas. It brings smiles to tired faces, glee in young children's voices, reflections of Christmas's past and present. But most of all, it helps us prepare for the birth of Christ. Being the director of this marvelous choir with a packed sanctuary of members and guests for six concerts every year, the choir lifting up their voices in song, having a magnificent orchestra, the marvelous bell choir joining in, it all comes together to create the wonderful sounds of the Christmas story. We would like to recreate that this evening with anthems from past concerts. We're so happy that the choir has recorded a virtual anthem just for this concert. We'll be ending the concert like we usually do with a dramatic telling of an inspirational Christmas story and song, The Christmas Tablecloth. With a few of the videos, we had some blackout issues, so it's on us, not your Comcast connection. From all of us, the bell choir, the orchestra, the chancel choir, the pastors, the staff, Glenn and myself, we wish you a very Merry Christmas filled with hope, love, and peace this Christmas tide. And God be with us until we meet again. Merry Christmas.
you're enjoying the concert so far. It's a time in the concert when the ushers walk down the aisle and pass the offering plates. We would ask you to help us continue the music ministry here at Westminster with your donation. You can do that in a number of ways. You can do it by text giving, by online giving, and by writing a check into the church. We would be so very grateful to have your offering and help us continue with the music here at Westminster. Glenn is going to play a piece of music for our offering, a brand new piece by Dan Forrest, O Little Town of Bethlehem.
This is a true story. November 1948. The Christmas season is beginning. And this Christmas is especially exciting for a young, enthusiastic minister just taking up his first job. He and his new wife arrive at their new church. It's a city church, a church that has seen better days. Once grand, this church has found that time has taken its toll on the building. Liz and I were very excited. We were starting our new lives together, both personally and professionally. But I will admit we were a bit disappointed when we saw the tired condition of the church. And Liz suggested that we spruce it up a bit, make it as attractive as possible for that first Christmas Eve, make Christmas something special. So the preacher and his wife scrub and wax floors they wash the accumulated grime off the church pews, and they paint the entire interior of the sanctuary. With a week to go, the young couple is excited. The church is starting to glow. Then the city enters a stretch of very bad weather, but that is to be expected in urban winters of the Northeast.
On December 22nd, a heavy storm strikes the region, and the church's old roof cannot handle the deluge. The roof develops a series of leaks. Soaked by water, a large portion of the plaster wall behind the altar collapses, leaving a gaping, ugly hole that cannot be repaired in time for Christmas Eve. As they clean up the soggy plaster mess and stare at the ugly hole, the new minister and his wife are disappointed, even discouraged. Liz was very upset. I was a bit more fatalistic. She had such high hopes and dreams about that Christmas Eve. And she groaned, Christmas is only two days away. That night, we were supposed to attend a charity auction. I really didn't want to go. I, I told Liz we should just skip it. But she insisted. She believed that obligation should be fulfilled. And besides, the experience might be a, a good distraction. <laughs> I was skeptical. So they attend reluctantly. But when the young pastor sees an antique tablecloth go up for bid, he realizes that this may be the answer to his problem. The tablecloth is huge, more than large enough to cover the whole, and it is beautiful. Handmade lace and gold thread run through it. I thought, that tablecloth would look spectacular on the wall behind the altar. No one would know there was an ugly hole hiding behind it. And so, I became a determined bidder. I was going to win that tablecloth. And I did, for six dollars and fifty cents. Remember, it's 1948, and bread, bread cost a dime then. Well, the young couple returns home thrilled that the church will look as beautiful as they thought that it could. It would be a place where the spirit of the season could come alive and be fulfilled. They want this Christmas Eve to reflect the wonder of the first Christmas.
Christmas Eve morning dawns clear, but windy and bitter cold. As the minister unlocks the church, he notices an older woman standing at the curb, apparently waiting for the bus. Because it is so cold and because he knows that the bus is at least a half hour away, he invites her into the church to the warmth to wait for the bus. The woman thanks him in halting English. She explains that she lives on the other side of town and has come to the church's neighborhood to apply for a job. A prominent family there is seeking a housekeeper babysitter, but she did not get the position. She is an Austrian World War II refugee and her English was not good enough for the position. I really felt sorry for her. She seemed tired and disappointed. Not angry, but sad and lonely. So she sat in a pew to the rear of the church to wait while I went up to the altar to hang the cloth. Stretched out to its full length, it was about 15 feet. And I was right. It was more than enough to not only hide the hole in the wall, but to actually beautify the front of the church. As she watches the minister, suddenly the woman exclaims, that's my cloth, that's my banquet cloth. She moves up the aisle and shows the minister in the corner her initials embroidered there. My husband had this made for me in Brussels, she says. She told me that she and her husband had lived in Vienna before the war. They hated and feared the Nazis and were going to flee to Switzerland. To avoid suspicion, her husband had sent her ahead, promising to follow in a few weeks with their belongings. But neither her husband nor their possessions ever arrived in Switzerland. She told me she learned a few weeks later that he died in a Nazi concentration camp. Visibly moved, the minister insists that she take the cloth home because it obviously means so much to her. The woman hesitates for a moment and responds, no, it looks beautiful on your wall and I live alone. She smiles ruefully and responds further, and I don't give banquets anymore. The tablecloth should stay here, she said. And then she turns and walks out the church to catch her bus home. The Christmas Eve services that night are beautiful. The church looks spectacular and the young couple's hard work has paid off. The tablecloth seems to glow, the gold thread sparkling in the candlelight. And the choir is inspired, singing with joy and wonder.
As the congregation leaves after the last service, there is gratitude for the work of the young preacher and his wife. As the last people were straggling out, I went into the pulpit to collect my sermon notes. I noticed a man who had come up to look at the cloth behind the altar. As he turned to leave, he told me how beautiful the church and the service were. And then, almost as an afterthought, he said, It's strange. Many years ago, my wife had a banquet cloth that looked just like that one when we used to live in Vienna. But she used it only on holidays and when the bishop came over for dinner. My wife is dead now, killed in the war. I was stunned. The young minister tells the man about the woman who was in the church that morning. He is equally stunned. For a second, the minister and his wife are filled with panic. How can they find her? They have no idea who she is. And then the minister remembers the name of the family who interviewed her. Rushing to the phone, he calls the family and asks for the woman's name and address. Minutes later, in the minister's old beat up car, they are on their way to the woman's apartment house. Giddy with excitement, we knocked on the door. The minute or two that it took her to answer seemed endless. When she finally opened up the door, the husband and wife stared at each other. They couldn't believe their eyes. And then, tearfully, joyfully, excitingly, they were clinging to each other's arms. Whenever we think about that Christmas Eve, Liz and I always say it was one of the very best of our lives. That 1948 Christmas Eve was transformational, redemptive, 
and renewing for the Austrian couple and for the minister and his wife. Christmas as it is meant to be. This story was told by Howard Schade, the young minister. He first recounted it at a church in Nyack, New York. It was transcribed and published by Richard Bauman. At the end of his transcription, Bauman asked this question. Was it a miracle, fate, or a string of incredible coincidences? You'll have to form your own opinion, he says. But for me, fate and coincidence tie for a distant second place. From all of us here, we wish you and yours the happiest of the holiday season and Merry Christmas.